Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today, the man who is thoughts become things, Neo Positivity. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Now, we're not sure if our friend Debbie G is going to be dropping in. If she does, she'll do, well, she'll do a drop-in because that's what she does when she drops in. Um, but uh, Debbie, if you're not going to make it, uh, we'll, we'll just send our love out to you and uh, continued healing and good health. Uh, we we're so glad to have you last week. That was, Neil, yeah, wasn't that great to have Debbie G back last week? Yeah. She couldn't even do the whole show, but it didn't matter, right? She had perfect timing. She just, she popped she in, the show lit up, and, uh, she, you know, everything went from there like it Absolutely. used to. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was that old feeling again, and we're looking forward to having her back on a regular basis. Um, but uh, we do have a third joining us today. His name is Tom Koreski, and Tom Tom's a C-level guy. He he works with the guys who run the, the things, who run the corporations, the companies, the ventures, the you name it. He If, if they run it, he helps them. And uh, to be quite honest, I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, I've always read, like, the bios and the, the pitches and so forth of the people who do that, uh, and they all read the same way, so I'm not really sure what they do. To be perfectly honest, but we're going to find out. So, Tom, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, great. And uh, I understand I'm going to be much happier by the end of this show. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Now, th- you, there is one thing you do have to understand, of course. Happiness, I think you probably know this. If you're a coach or, or a teacher, you probably know this. But happiness is an inside job. Absolutely. So it, it comes down to what do you? How, what's your response going to be? But I, I, I'll kind of go out on a limb and say your your response is going to be conducive to feeling better by the end of the show. I'm there. Let's go. Right. See, here we go. First prediction of the day, bang, hit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so give us your story, Tom. Tell us how you got into this. Uh, into podcasting or guests or... Well, yeah, all of it. C- but, uh, pretty, C-suite. I mean, there's so many ways to go with that. Well, because you, you have a book, and your book, is, uh, the, the main title is C-Suite Success. So obviously that's where you're aimed at. And that that's where uh, a lot of your audience uh, comes from, hails from. So how did you get to that audience, I guess, is the, the gist of my question. But, yeah, if you want to bring in the podcasting and all that, absolutely. Well, you know, how I got to C-Suite is life. I mean, you know, I just went through life, a series of doors closed, a series of doors opened, and... I just happened to, uh, you know, go through the right doors and it got me into uh, the C-suite Fortune 500 company, uh, got me to be a CEO of a $400 million company. And uh, now I'm uh, the CEO of myself because uh, I'm part owner of uh, two small businesses. So that's kind of, you know, the C-suite. And I uh, along the way, I did some public speaking and they teach you that when you do public speaking, the best way to do that is to share your own stories. And there's two reasons for that. You know, the first one is if you're a public speaker, if you forget your own stories on stage, you got a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's easy to remember. They're, they're your own stories. And, and the second thing is you relate to the audience much better because people love stories. They don't like Absolutely. facts. They don't like, you know, so you kind of illustrate facts with stories. And so I was building a database of all my stories and I said, man, I got enough to build up. Uh, I got enough stories to uh, write a book. So I did. So here we are now, and people kind of want to hear what I have to say. Uh, God only knows why, but they do, and, <laughs> I, and I'm on podcasts. Well, well, I was hoping you could explain that. So you can't just leave it at that. God only knows why. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, but I, actually, I, I do have uh, a little curiosity about that because, I mean, people who, who run companies or, or who are in the top echelon of a company – uh, they're, they're human beings just like anybody else. So obviously they have the same kinds of, of human issues, but they are dealing with a different kind of thing in that they're running the company. They're not one of the employees who are, you know, doing a particular niche kind of operation. And that does give you a different kind of perspective. I mean, now I have never run a large company. I have been an entrepreneur for the last 20 plus years. So I know what it's like to run my own venture with a few people working with me and so forth. But I'm sure it's different um, in the sense that, you kind of have more responsibility when you're running a large operation like that. And, and I, I can certainly see how your own experience, I mean, you, you said, what was it? A $400 million company that you were running. So clearly you have the experience that talks to the people who are also doing a similar kind of thing. But, but what is it about that environment that makes it even a little bit different from say what an entrepreneur experiences or, or even what just a mid-level employee experiences? Well, look, if you're an entrepreneur, you probably have to uh, feed your family and yourself. 
you know, as uh, the CEO, I, I had to feed t- uh, over 2,500 people. So mm. that that's kind of a lot of res- well, I don't know if it's around a, a lot of responsibility, but it's a, a different mindset uh, to say, look, uh, I have to make sure that you know people are thriving and people are succeeding, and you know they don't have to worry about job security tomorrow or where they're going to get their next meal from. That's that's on me, right? Uh, they say, look, you can only miss payroll once. You know, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> if, you, if you miss it once, then you know you have no more employees. Actually, that means you can miss it zero times, but I get your point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, so it's just a kind of different mindset. Uh, it, it, that doesn't mean that the, the weight on your shoulders is bigger because in fact, when I was CEO, I thought I had the easiest job in a room. Mm. Um, you know, I used to tell people all the time, I, I, I really have only three things that I have to do in any, any given situation. Uh, one is to make sure that people understand, you know, what the culture is, what the vision is. Mm. So we are all rowing in the same direction. Uh, second, make sure that they understand what their particular, uh, contribution is to that vision or to that culture. And they buy into that and they understand how to deliver on that. And third is to equip them, you know, whether it's through assets, through help, through training, whatever. And they just get out of their way. You know, instead of hiring stupid people and micromanaging, uh, you get some really bright individuals, uh, kind of show them the way and give them the support that they need and let them go. Uh, their success then boils down to your success. So that sounds so simple. So then why do they need a coach? <laughs> Everyone needs a coach. <laughs> well, well, look, you know, for example, right? I mean, uh, as a CEO, my sales director said to me one time, I said, Tom, can you uh, come to see this very large, you know, customer with me who happened to be, you know, starting with a W? And uh, so we had to go down and sit down with the buyer, right? So my job in that particular situation was just to, sit down with the head buyer uh, for that very large organization with my sales director and, and, and support my sales director and support the process, right? So um, maybe you can say I was coaching that sales director through that process to make sure that it was being done the right way. Um, you know, one time uh, my marketing VP came to me and said, Tom, you know, we're doing a commercial. Can you stop by and, and give me your opinion? What, what do you think, right? So went down to the set. We looked at the storyboards, looked at different shoots. Uh, we looked at the casting and, and I, you know, they, they were just asking me for my opinion mm-hmm. because I've done it many, many times. So again, I, I guess you could call it a coach, but it's really just lending a hand where somebody's asking you for support to say, Hey, I need your help. All right. And if, if they're not asking you for help, then, you know, don't stand over their shoulder and micromanage and get out of their way because they know what they're doing. I love the fact that you've mentioned micromanaging three different times yeah. so far in a way that says don't do it <laughs> i think it's probably one of the biggest mistakes i ever saw when i was in the corporate world and it's one of the biggest mistakes i especially have seen in the entrepreneurial world um i i make it a point with companies that i run to not do that um but i even with people i was close to and cared about i, I used to just cringe <laughs> sometimes at the way people did things well uh, here, here, you know. here's a here's, here's another wise saying for you i i didn't say it i think uh stephen covey said it he said we see the world not as it is but as we are so mm, good point you know you know if if, if you don't trust yourself if, if you don't have I, I guess the confidence in yourself that you're going to do a great job that's probably why you're micromanaging other people because you also don't trust them and you think that you know, they're not competent and they can't do it. And in fact, it's probably the first thing from the truth. So just hire the right people, you know, uh, give them the tools and leave them alone, for God's sake. Crazy guys, conf- I love that. That's confidence growth. You know, when you let your, mm. it was crazy. In the, in the, I used to be a, a cop, Tom, in New Jersey, and certain sergeants, certain supervisors were just micromanagers and everyone hated them. Everyone hated them for it for so many different reasons. But it gives, like, if you're a lieutenant and you're micromanaging, or let's say you're a lieutenant and you're not micromanaging, you're giving your sergeant that confidence. Okay. I, he know, he, he's got faith in me. And then he starts doing a good job. And then next thing you know, he's the lieutenant. And, you know, that's where that type of mentality comes from. You know, when someone gives you the rings, and you're like, all right, I'm on my own. It's time to nut up or shut up, you know, and that's when you learn things about yourself and you grow and you become a better person. So I definitely have experienced a lot of that in my life. There were two guys, two lieutenants in particular that micromanaged so much in the police department that they were known for it and everyone hated them for it, yet they still couldn't stop from doing it. And it sucked. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for your service, Neil. Thank you for saying that. Tremendous respect for anyone who says that to cops and, and first responders. <laughs> well, the, these days, it's a, it's an upside-down world these days when it comes to the police. I, I just, you know, I, I don't understand. You know, the, the other day I was uh, in, in a Zoom call, and uh, I had to do it in a parking lot because I didn't have any time to do it otherwise. So I'm sitting in a parking lot. I'm on a Zoom call, and this squad, squad car comes and uh, comes behind me and flips the lights on. I'm like, what the heck? We, you know, we're, 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 I'm just sitting here on a Zoom call. I'm not driving. driving. The car's <laughs> off, you know. <laughs> so they come up and they say, sir, do you know you don't have a front license plate in the state of California? You have to have a front license plate. I said, well, you know, I bought the car like this. What can I say? So anyway, I had to interrupt my Zoom call, get off. And, you know, they gave me a, a, a summons for, um, I, think, I think they call it a fix-it ticket or something like that. You just have to get a front license plate on it. And at the end of all, they, they thought I was really pissed off. And I said, that, you know, they said, well, you know, anything else that we can do? I said, no, nah, just guys have a, you know, good day and stay safe out there. And they were like, wow, I thought you were going to curse at me or something <laughs> for, for, for giving me a ticket. But it's like, yeah, they're just doing their job. I mean, I, I thought it was kind of silly, but hey, you know, they're doing a job and therefore, you know, it's for the better good. So stay safe. That's crazy. I, I can remember there were times in the police department when, if you bought a bag of weed, yeah, I got a bag of weed. The sergeant's like, throw that shit away. Go back to the streets. Like, they don't want you to waste your time on that little bit of stuff. So mm-hmm. tickets and stuff like that. When I hear you, I was in Camden, New Jersey, which is at the, at the time is when it was the most dangerous city in America. So when I hear people tell me ticket writing stories, <laughs> I just cringe. I'm like, come on, man. This guy didn't have nothing better to do with his time. And then you said there's more than one. I'm like, two guys waste their time on a front license plate ticket? Hey, whatever. <laughs> All right, two more fun stories. All right, that sounds good to me. So uh, Neil was kind of giving you the heads up uh, at the beginning about you know what it takes to connect in with the audience. Um, and his, he's all about thoughts become things, as you can see from his T-shirt, which he wears all the time. That's how he lets everybody know that thoughts become things. Um, I, well, Neil, I would, you're, you're the one who should ask this question. You not know, me. I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I would like to know, uh, when you first learned about the law of attraction, like, did your parents teach you? Did you see the secret when you were 28? Like me, like, when did you first learn about it? And when did it first sink in? How old were you? Uh, you know, I, I, I was, um, and I'll just kind of label it in, in the mannerism where I talk about, I talk about leadership. Um, you know, I, I, I figured out very early on. Uh, and he can say law of attraction to other people, uh, or other people's attraction to me in a leadership role. It, it, it just happened very early on. I, I don't know. I mean, some people they say are, are wired and, and born as leaders. I, I think that's true to a certain extent. It's part of it that is your DNA. Uh, but you also learn that as you go on. But, you know, I, I always, and to this day, uh, I can walk into a room and you can sense if there's a vacuum in leadership. If, if, you know, you're, you're in a dynamic, you're in a meeting, uh, you're with a group of friends and, and nobody's taking a lead on, on a topic that somebody should take a lead on. And my natural tendency is to kind of just kind of jump in and, and fill that void, fill that role and, and lead the process. And you guys, you know, said give some, some practical, um, you know, pointers to, to the audience. And one of the practical pointers I give to people all the time is, is to know what your why is. And, and I call your why your vision. And every person should have a vision, a personal vision for themselves. I had a friend the other day that told me, um, yeah, I, I, I've got one of those, Tom. I, I want to, I want to own a house in five years. I said, well, that's a pretty good plan. That's a pretty good objective. That's not really a vision. I mean, that's, if that's what your life is all about is just to own a house in five years, you're short selling yourself. <laughs> uh, it's got to be something, you know, much bigger than yourself. So I'll share you with my vision. My vision for my life is man of God, leader of men. And it's, it's a pretty cool and simple statement because whenever I come to those decisions in life where I have to make a choice of, of doing, and that's really what life is all about. You're just kind of choosing between different options. And, you know, I put it, I put it against that vision test. I say, okay, does it honor God or is it a leadership role? And if it's, uh, fails one of those two questions, I don't do it. If it meets those objectives, then I probably dive in two feet and give it 110%. So that's what, uh, you know, all your listeners, uh, if you don't have a personal vision statement, you know, get one for yourself. Uh, if I can use uh, Nike or Puma, I use these uh, examples all the time. 
Everybody thinks Nike's vision statement is just do it. That's not true. It's we unleash human potential. And and Puma, an equally good company, uh, their objective is to uh, become the fastest brand on earth. So mm-hmm. we unleash human potential, fastest brand on earth. So guess who they endorse, right? Nike is the Jordans, the Serena Williams of the world, you know, who, I don't know, there's all kinds of stories about, you know, Michael Jordan has, has failed so many times in his life, taking, taking so many shots, and then, you know, it became, you know, uh, the, well, probably the, the greatest of all time in, in, in basketball, and Serena Williams, the same thing. And, and Puma, you know, they're endorsed Usain Bolt, who's the fastest man on earth, right? And, and Michael Schumacher was a Formula One driver, they endorsed him. So just, you know, those companies know what they're about, and that kind of dictates and mandates the decisions that they make on even things who they endorse or, or some other stuff. Um, so just get a vision statement for your life, whatever it is. Make it simple so you can understand it, and other people can understand it. And that's uh, when you get up every morning, you say, okay, well, am I helping build towards that vision today, or am I doing something off track? When you said know your why, you resonated with a lot of people, but particularly with one person in the live stream named Ken. He says, know your why. That's my mantra. <laughs> <laughs> was so excited about that. You so got really to cool. live in that, I believe. Uh, every day, I know, I, well, since I found out what my purpose is on this earth, every day I live in that and I love it. It makes me feel good to follow. Um, and shout out to Ken Hahnemann. He's one of the speakers in my summit tomorrow. You guys know Neo Positivity's Thoughts Become Things Summit is happening tomorrow from 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Ken has a book called Ungraduated. I love it. It's like everything you learned up to graduation in high school, we're going to ungraduate from all <laughs> that, break it all down and get rid of all the stigmas and all the BS uh, that the school system might have put in you. Um, Tom, I want to ask the question again because I might have lost you with it. When was the first time that you realized that your thoughts were dictating what was going to happen to you next? And I, I, a lot of people saw The Secret and the, the movie The Secret, and they're like, yeah, I learned it, but it didn't really sink in until a couple examples happened. And I was like, wow, I really am creating my future with my mindset, with my thoughts. Uh, w- when did that occur for you? Uh, young age, older? Um. You know, I'm also a very action oriented, uh, individual. If you look at my disc assessment, I'm a high D and an I. I don't know if your audience knows what that means, but that's kind of just the way you, you process information to process the world. And, and high Ds are very, uh, task oriented. So I'm a very task oriented individual. So from an early age on, you know, I, I always try to, you know, I got satisfaction and reward from seeing tasks accomplished. Right. So that kind of trained me at a very early age. Uh, you know, for example, why, why did I go to school for engineering undergraduate? I you know I go back to my college days. Well, that was a task oriented. You know, I saw my father's an engineer. I kind of equated that with success. So I developed myself to go to school for engineering in, in college. So I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's kind of, uh, from an early, from an early age, I, I was always task oriented. So. Whatever I did, it was getting me towards that goal, towards that task. And that's what gave me gratification. That gave me satisfaction. Uh, you know, I, I say to gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I say to people all the time, look, there's two side, two types of companies. You know, one side, one type of company says, you know, Neil, I really appreciate you worked eight hours today. I saw you work really hard. Um, really kudos to you for, for really trying. Now, Neil, you didn't get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> but, you tried, but you tried really hard. So I really appreciate it. Right. Or, you know, the another type of organization says, you know, Neil, I really appreciate the eight things you got done today. It's only three o'clock in the afternoon. Go, you know, go out and take your kid out for a ball game or, you know, go out and get a, you know, a old fashioned or, you know, whatever you want. And it's only three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Because because you got the six or eight things done that you were supposed to get done. And and I'm more that kind of guy. You know, I yeah. I, I don't. Rebel in working my butt off for eight hours a day and get not, not get nothing accomplished. By the way, I, I, I got to realize something here. Well, I, I did realize it when you said the name, Neo. When you said Ken Hanneman, I said, oh, wait a minute. Ken Han- he, he was actually a guest on the podcast a while back. And I said, oh, that's who that is. Well, thank you for saying his name. Otherwise, it probably would have slipped right past me. But hello, Ken. Welcome. Glad you could join us today. Uh, <laughs> Tom, you mentioned something uh, a few minutes ago. 
And it, it kind of slipped past us in the conversation, but I want to come back to it because I think it's really important. You mentioned failure, particularly I think it was in relation to Michael Jordan and all the times that he had failed. I remember a, a quote uh, that I heard from Will Smith actually came out of his mouth. It was something that he posted on Instagram, I think. Um, he talked about how people uh, have a tendency to think that when they see somebody who is successful, that they were they kind of sprouted out as, you know, they sprouted as a successful person out of the ground, right? And they don't realize all the different failures that people go through in order to become successful. So I was wondering, just from your experience, can you talk about that? What, when you think about that concept, what do you think about? I, I think about it all the times that I failed, right? Um, and, and look, failure is okay. Uh, but not learning from failure is not okay. So it, it's okay to fail. Just, just learn from it. You know, uh, I can use, you know, hundreds of examples in, in my life where I failed. For, so for example, public speaking, right? I remember I thought I was a great public speaker. Then I watched myself on video and I said, Oh my God, I suck. I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, <laughs> I, I, I have to do something about this. Right. So, so then came a lot of hard work. Uh, on improving my skills as a, as a public speaker. And it was just self-reflection to say, look, I, I failed. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, people are afraid of failure because they kind of over-exaggerate their failure. And, and probably one of my biggest failures was when I got, you know, after 15 years in, in corporate America, I got fired from my job. Mm -hmm. And we can spend the whole podcast on, you know, why I got canned. Um, obviously it wasn't my fault. It was somebody else's fault. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, 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 you know, I thought that my life was over. Right. I, I was like, Oh my God, if, you know, 15 years, uh, how am I going to pay the bills next month? You know, I've got a wife and, and, and uh, three kids. I mean, you know, just like stuff spinning through my mind for like two weeks where I was a total wreck. I was a train wreck for about two weeks. And then like one day I woke up, I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm, I'm still the same guy. I still have the same tools. Um, you know, I, it's, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, it wasn't. So I just mm -hmm. imagined this, this catastrophe. Uh, and that's what most people do that they, they, they're afraid to fail because they're, they want to avoid the catastrophe. Or if they do fail, they think it's a catastrophe and it's not. I just kind of learn from it, take the benefits from it. And, you know, that was actually a great opportunity for me because up until that point, I just kind of looked at myself as as an employee doing, you know, doing tasks, doing jobs. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the first time I, I looked at myself and I said, well, you know, why don't I look at myself as a brand rather than as, as, a, as an employee? Let me look at a brand and say, OK, what are my brand assets? Right? What are my qualities? Um, what am I good at? And, and while we're on this topic, here's an, another question for your audience. You know, ask each person should ask themselves these three questions. Who am I? What am I good at? And what am I passionate about? Right? Because um, when you answer those three questions, you go from a job. And most people just think of themselves as having a job. Some people think of themselves as having a careers. And a few of people are fortunate enough to say, OK, I'm living my calling. And when I got to answer those three questions for myself or who I am, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? I began to lay a path of, of what is my calling and what am I going to do for the rest of my life. And I branded myself. I looked at myself as a consumer brand and that's the way I was doing it. So, um, that, that's just, you know, the, the, the way it works. So, um, don't over exaggerate, don't want to exaggerate failure. Uh, something will come good out of it. Look, see what the benefit is. And that's what you go with. Yeah. That's how when people, when people are trying to figure out what they're, uh, why they're here, what they're meant to do, that's what, that's the advice I give them, you know, cause once you ask yourself those questions and you cut and you have that genuine answer and you start to pursue that in life, it's when the waves are all of a sudden coming at your back. You just start getting phone calls out of nowhere. People are meeting, talking about you in a positive light. Next thing you know, you're on your way. So if anyone wants to find their purpose, follow those exact steps. But be true to yourself. I, I, I've asked people questions like that before, and they're like, I love to sleep. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to need a better answer to that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, everybody needs a good sleep, you know. Um, so, yeah, you know, make sure whatever your answer is, you know, it's serving. People I mean, if you're, if you're a sleep humanity. researcher, if you're a sleep researcher, that might be, you know, that might be a passion. You know, sleep might be a passion for you, but uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Beyond that, <laughs> act of sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I, I love those questions, especially the third one, because I believe it's probably the one that trips more people up than anything else. What's your passion? And, and not that they can't imagine what their passion might be, but zeroing in on what it actually is, and it can be more than one, by the way, but zeroing in on what a passion is, it, it's kind of like we trip ourselves very often when we get you know, to that question, when we start asking that, because for many people, I think it's for the first time trying to answer the question, what do I love? Yeah. What's really, really important to me? I get, I don't know. That's what I get all the time. Most of the answers I've gotten, I've asked almost everyone I meet this because it's a good indicator of who you're talking to. Mm. And I swear out of the thousands of people I've asked this to, I might've gotten four answers and two of them were from kids. Uh, look, talk, you know, and talk about law of attraction. I mean, you know, if, if you want people to uh, to be attracted or, or you want to influence people, if you're not passionate about something, they're not going to, you know, they're, they're not going to come follow you because like, OK, well, he's not passionate about it. So he's a bump on a log. Why, you know, what I want to get to know, you know, what's the point? But if you're passionate about it, that, you know, that oozes other people to come on board and yeah. and they become passionate it becomes, you know, before you watch, it's a movement. It's funny you say that. I'm, one of my first jobs was at this company called Pro Direct. It was telemarketing. You sit in the booth, interrupt people at dinner all day long. <laughs> I mean, well, <laughs> dinner, dinner hours. Uh, asking them to confirm that they still want that credit card because it's people who have already applied for a, a credit card, but it's been a little while. Um, and I, I, I sucked at it. <laughs> I hated the job, didn't want to be there, had never had a cub, cub, cubicle job before. Um, but I got my first credit card. And I was really enthusiastic about my credit card. And I saw, I learned with the prime rate, annual fees. I learned all that, you know, through the training of being able to, you know, sell these credit cards. And once I got passionate about having a credit card and what it could do for you and da da da, all of a sudden my sales went up. And when you're yeah. telling that, when you were saying that, it made me think about that. I haven't thought about that since she said it was like 1999. <laughs> uh, yeah, sales went up as soon as I got a credit card and really started started to love it and appreciate it. That's when uh, everything went up. So put your passion into it. I don't care if you're, I always say this, I don't care if you're walking up the stairs. If you focus on every single step and you're proud of yourself, something's going to come out of that. It's that law of attraction thing, being proud of yourself, that attitude of gratitude manifests more of that. So if you take pride in everything you do, every letter you write, every task you do, every time you drive, you're being present, which is a key element in all my mental exercises. You're appreciative for something about you, which manifests appreciating more about you. And the world is just a better place. And I could probably name 50 more things that are, that are benefits from that. Yeah, I believe you could. <laughs> if we give you enough rope, you'll, you'll, you'll take over the show with those. <laughs> this is, you, you, I, you, you may not be able to predict this. Maybe you're actually getting the vibe of it. I don't know. Neo, literally every single day, or I should say every single night, uh, was it 12 to 2? Is that what it is? So 12 midnight, midnight to 2 a.m. Midnight till 2 a.m. Yeah. He goes into his, his little private space and he just works on himself for two straight hours every single day, focusing on stuff like this stuff. And, Honestly, uh, I, I don't. I don't never go to bed before two thirty, so it's it's more than two hours. It's more than two. Okay, all right. Well, but that was what so, you told me, but still, it gets so fun though. It gets it gets to the point where I'm excited, and then I look at the clock and it's two fifteen, and I'm like, well, I don't got no job. I don't have no reason to wake up early. I might as well keep going. I'm watering seeds and manifesting a great future for myself. Why would I stop to go get some rest? I'm gonna get my eight hours. If I sleep from three to eleven or from ten to two to ten, I'm gonna get my eight hours regardless. And I end up excited, I end up going to sleep excited and remembering my dreams and all that other stuff. It's just, I'm in a different headspace now, man. Different headspace. Well, yeah, I mean, everybody, and I think, uh, maybe Walt, you mentioned it earlier and, uh, you know, they ask you, well, how, how'd you get to be a famous actor or how'd you get to be mm -hmm. a famous, uh, you know, this and that, but, you know, they, they like to be there, but, uh, they don't understand the the work behind the scenes that goes in there to get you to that level, yeah. right? So two hours a day, I mean, that's basically about 10% of your, you know, 24 hours in a day. So if you're spending two hours a day working on yourself and working on your good habits, that's only 10% of your time. That's not a lot. And you know, that's what I was going to say earlier. 
most people spend 40 hours a week at work. I spend more than 40 hours a week doing what I do. Those two hours between midnight and two in the morning are an extra two on top of the eight that I do during the day. And I don't think people realize that. They think that I retired at the age of 28 and pilot in Florida and doing all this crazy stuff that I be doing. They think that I just went in the corner and said, I love life 10 times. And that's when it happened. <laughs> no, I have over 54 alarms that go off throughout the day, waking me up to do a mental exercise, do an affirmation. I got people calling me, all kind of reminders going off. And then when the reminders do go off, I got to make the choice to do it. I could say, okay, I'm cooking right now. or I'm in this email right now. I'll get to it in five minutes, which I do sometimes. And, but you know, you may, chances are you're probably not going to get back around to it. You got to have the discipline to do it. Yeah. And you have to do it a lot. Uh, real quick example, Floyd Mayweather. A lot of people don't like him, but you can't knock his driving. You can't knock his success ratio. He's 50 and 0. Uh, he used to throw these outrageous parties, especially like birthday parties, but he wasn't, he doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't do drugs. He was notorious for leaving that party and jogging home <laughs> every single time. And it, we're talking about 10, 15 miles. That was just him training hard every day and people don't see that but it takes that you get out of things what you put in so make sure you're putting in the word That's i agree cool. my that. drive <laughs> tom when you're when you're working with um sea level people um like like we said before they're, they're like everybody else but let's be honest there, there is a little bit of a difference in the personalities of people who tend to gravitate toward that kind of situation and uh, without getting into uh, the details of, of who that person is, we, we can do that if you want to. I'm more interested in what is it that people who are in that general grouping, what, what, where do they tend to trip up most often? Where, where do they need the most help most often? I would say the biggest one is ego. Mm -hmm. I, they're, they get to the level and they, and they think it's all about them. And, um, you know, it, they make all the decisions and they're the smartest person in the room. Um, and, and the second that you learn to get over yourself and it's not about you, but it's about something much bigger to you, then you become successful. As long as you think, you know, it's about you and, um, you know, and, and, and look, you know, ego, power, all that stuff, it's an aphrodisiac. People, people get kind of get, you know, hung up on it and, and they love it and, and they become self-absorbed and, and after a while just become idiots because of that self-absorption mm -hmm. and, and everybody tunes out from them. But um, that's, I would say, the, the biggest challenge for those people is to say that, you know, their egos, they're perfect. They know everything. Um, it, it's all about them and they made everything happen. And, you know, the fact is they didn't make everything happen. I, I, I remember when I was, um, you know, working for Fortune 100, it was a, it was a very classical marketing company. And, uh, they always had a tendency to, uh, make, uh, and it was a, a large, uh, international company that had local subsidiaries in every one of the countries. So they will always stick a marketing guy as the general manager in, in the local subsidiaries, right? Because they were a marketing driven company. So they wanted a marketing head at, had to lead it. And all these guys were egocentric, right? Um, mm -hmm. and then they gave me an assignment and, and, I, I'm a good marketeer, but I was never known as, you know, like one of those classical top of the guy market. I was more people person and my company was always successful and they couldn't put a finger on it. They said, I don't know. It's, it's something about Tom. It's something about that company. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> it, it's something about them because it wasn't marketing, right? It, you know, it wasn't about the ego. It wasn't about a skill set. Um, it, it was more about, you know, how, how I empower, how I empower people. I treated people. One of the nicest compliments I had was when I was leaving that job, uh, they had a, you know, I was going to on to the next assignment and then somebody was coming in to replace me. And, and we had a farewell party for me and the new guy was there as well. And, and my CFO got up and said, um, you know, I just want to thank you because you believed in us. Mm. And once you believed in us, we believed in ourselves. Now, I, I can't think of a better compliment than somebody to give me that. that right. Yeah, that's a really great one. That shows uh, the kind of impact that you left for for them to say for him to say something like that. I mean, that's yeah. that's a pretty big deal, right there. It was her. It was, it was her. CFO. Her. <laughs> <laughs> the reason she was successful, you know, is because she had that mentality the whole time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so, you know, ego. You know, uh, people just have to get over themselves. 
So that re- leads to the next question. How do they get over themselves? And, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say very often they, they have to crash somewhere before they're going to do it. But do people manage to over, get over themselves without having that crash first? Um, you know, life humbled me for me, for me to get over my ego. So it, it works for me in that sense. Um, I've, uh, I, I've seen, and, and you really don't know when, when people crash. I mean, I, one of the examples I use is, uh, this guy, Ruben Mark. Ruben Mark was the, uh, the CEO and then became the chairman, uh, for Colgate Pomalov. Uh, this was back in, uh, late eighties and nineties. And, uh, I think, uh, for like 40 consecutive quarters, uh, Colgate Pomalov made their numbers on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. So he was a darling of the Wall Street and he was very successful. Um, career wise, right? Uh, pe- not many people know his son died of a heroin overdose when he was 21. Hmm. Right. So I, I don't know. I mean, are you successful? You know, you may be successful in business, but are you actually successful in life if your son takes his own life? Hmm. Right. Um, so I, I think it kind of forces you to ask him some questions to say, okay, what, is, what does success look like for me? Right. And, um, the one thing that I can guarantee you is, is life will humble every individual somehow. You know, maybe it's not in their career. Maybe it's in their family life. Maybe it's in their health. You know, Steve Jobs, as successful as he was, you know, he's no longer with us because mm-hmm. life humbled him through his health. So life will humble all of us. Um, I think it's just, you know, how do you react to that being humbled moment? And do you, do you take that to grow from it and become a better person? Do you take that to give up on life? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but I love uh, that idea though, because I mean, the idea is that our responses are first of all, what we control. And second of all, they dictate what happens afterward. That's, a, that's what I hear you saying anyway, which I agree with. And I, I, I wish that I had known that message when I was younger. I suspect a lot of people really don't know that. Which is kind of odd, really. It's so, it, it, it's so simple. How could we not know it? But our, our culture, our, um, our tribes, our, you know, the, the people that we learn from and so forth, that, that, that message just doesn't seem to come through. I mean, I, I don't know. Do you have any sense on that? Why is it that, that we really don't get that so often? I think part of it is we're, we're, we think we're, especially look, you get to the sea level, everybody thinks they, they have these egos, everything they think, everybody thinks they're Superman or Superwoman, right? They can do anything. Um, and one of the keys to life is also to ask for help mm-hmm. and, and ask people to help, ask people to, and in fact, I, this, this is something that I had, uh, uh, my daughter's now 27. I think she was about 17 or 18 at the time. And we had a, a long chat about, setting priorities and because she was just kind of overwhelmed with school and admissions and everything else. And, and I said, well, why don't you just ask me for help? You know, um, because the fact is there are people all around you and they're all love you and they're all willing to help you. Well, not everybody loves you because you got some, you got some people that like, like to throw uh, roadblocks in your way, but that's a whole nother story for another time. But, but most people that are around you, they want to help you. They're, they're mm-hmm. there to cheer you on. They love you. That's why they're around you. Um, so just reach out and ask them for some help. No big deal. Mm. Well, we were talking about this not too long ago about feeling like an inconvenience. Yeah. And that is a, that's a huge part of why people don't reach out. They feel like an inconvenience. I, uh, Tom, recently I, like my summit's coming up and I felt like I was overreaching, uh, to, promote the summit to my friends and family. So all of my promoting primarily is to people I don't know. Um, and, but then I had this moment of clarity where I said, every day I get a phone call from somebody saying, Hey, Neo, I got this ticket or this happened or I got pulled over and they're asking me for all this police vice all the daggone time. <laughs> the least I can do. It's something to go into the summit and click like or drop a comment. And it, it took me forever to get to that. But ever since then, I've been like, forget all that. Y'all owe me. Y'all owe me. <laughs> Many, much, much legal advice as I've been given over the years. Y'all owe me. Um, but it, you know, it's just a small example. In so many areas of life, I felt like that. And I know other people do too. Reach out for that help. The other, the other area is 
your pride. You don't want to let people know that you're feeling sad or bad or down or uh, maybe not so confident in a certain area that you've been confident in your whole life. That'll kill you. That'll kill you. Let that stuff go. Let it go and reach out. Trust me, you guys. Let it go and reach out. I agree completely. And, and I had a direct experience with that. Neil, you were a part of it uh, this past October. Um, Tom, my, my uh, wife of 23 years, left me unexpectedly. And it happened right after a Friday podcast, actually. Uh, and I went from very high to very low in about uh, 10 seconds flat. Yeah. And I was, I was so happy, uh, especially after the fact to have had friends like Neo and Debbie and others who have been a part of this show and who have been a part of my, my online life. Everyone that I reached out to, they were there for me. They were there for me in a big way. And, and I especially needed it on that day because I needed life coaches and therapists. And I had all these friends who were life coaches and therapists ready to just jump in for me. I could easily have seen myself being afraid to reach out like that. In fact, I think I actually, um, when, when I, when I found the letter that she had left for me, I think for a split second, I had that feeling of, Oh, I, I, I can't call on them. And then, I think it was like Neil's voice in the back of my head saying, yes, you can <laughs> pick up the phone, send a text, reach out, do something. <laughs> and it made all the difference in the world. So now look yeah. at how happy you are today. You're smiling and you're having a time of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, and it, hasn't been, happiness. It, it hasn't been an easy path. It's not like it's all been sunshine and roses. I mean, there's been a lot of ups and downs as, as Neil could tell you, but when you have that level, I, I call it social connectedness. When you have that level of social connectedness and you leverage it and you lean on it when you really need it, it's everything. It's absolutely everything. It, 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 it literally saves your sanity among other things. Because when you go through something that that's especially that crazy, it, you feel like, you know, the world is starting to fall apart in front of your eyes. And then you reach out and you connect with somebody who you have a close connection to. And it's almost like the ground steadies. It's mm -hmm. like the whole world just kind of falls back into place for a moment. It's like, oh, I don't know what that earthquake was, but yeah. I'm back again. <laughs> Is that okay. Yeah. As a, I want to say this, as a, as a person, I lead a really good life. Probably the best that I know. And I know a lot of people know a lot of millionaires, know a couple billionaires. Most of them are miserable. Every millionaire I know in Tampa is freaking miserable. My parents <laughs> hate them, kids hate them, wife hates them. Um, I live a really, really cushy, really great life. And one day I might be sick, like last Saturday. Mm. And it's, it's terrible for a whole day. And it hits me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, oh, my gosh, people live like this all the time. Like, So for me, it's a huge wake up to do any and everything you can to stay and be out of that headspace. So, you know, kudos to you all for reaching out, for shutting that voice up and just doing it. Cause when I hear you in a state of mind like that, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like I'm like, run from run. But yeah. Reach out. You guys reach out to me. Anybody, you know, could reach out to me. I'm here for everybody. You know, I've been working volunteer for the past 13 years, 14 years now. Um, they ain't nothing going to change. So reach out. I'm here for you guys. Yeah, beautiful thing there. Well, that that's why you want to have somebody like Tom. That's that that's the role in a sense that you play for uh, the people who are running companies. They they they're the ones. The ones who reach out to you are the ones who are the smart ones. They said, "Yeah, they, I need you know, help." Exactly. You know that that's why I love alcoholics because the first thing you got to do is an alcoholic and say, "I got a problem." Uh, yeah. You got to meet your problems, so and now you can find help. Yeah. And uh, you know. Many people in, in senior executives, uh, you know, all of a sudden the board comes in one day and they're fired mm. and they don't understand why they, you know, they, it's, but if they kind of reached out before and got some advice, got some help, got some counsel, um, then, you know, they, they may not get fired, right? Because then they can still do something about it. By the time they get the ax, it's too late, right? Uh, they didn't seek that help. So, yeah. Tom, I want to ask you something real quick, uh, because for, a little bit. This was my job in Tampa. How would you feel and would you be receptive if while you were the CEO, I walked into your office, jeans, T-shirt, some Jordans, and I said, look, like Hitch from the movie. You ever seen the movie Hitch? No. With, uh, Will Smith? No. Uh, well, anyway, 
I walk in your office and I'm this life coach that specializes in the law of attraction. And you're like, okay, what the heck are you doing here? And I'm like, 20 of your executives got together and paid me to come and have a couple sessions with you. Would you throw me out of your office or would you be like, uh, let me hear what you got to say? Uh, 40 years ago, I would have thrown you out of my office. Uh, today, today I would say, 20 of my people paid you? Well, I'm definitely going <laughs> to listen to you. <laughs> right? Because, look, you know, if, obviously, if, if, if people that are on my staff hired you to help me, obviously there's a dire need for help. You know, that's, that's people crying out, say, this guy needs help and we love him enough to actually get him some help. Right? Um, now, you know, if you just call, walked on the, you know, walked in a, off the street as a cold call and say, Hey, how would you like some, you know, life coaching? I may not say, okay, well, I don't I mean, know that's, what, yeah, that's you know, a different but, story. but if, uh, but if, if, if my, my people said Tom needs help, um, and if I don't listen to it, shame on me. Well, I've had wives send me to their husband's office, mostly offices would get together and pay me to go in a couple of times. I got thrown out and I'm like, listen, uh, I'm paid regardless. I'm not giving this money back. And I, you know, I was able to walk I think three times. I was able to walk out, you know, with the money and not actually do my job. Well, that, but, that's the ego and the pride that we talked about earlier. Right. I mean, some of these guys have big egos and big prides and say, what the hell are you talking about? Why do, why do I need help? I'm perfect. And I don't need any help. You know, everybody else around me that's not performing needs help. <laughs> it's not the way it works. I wonder how the conversations went after I left. <laughs> like, get the hell out of here. And then the guy exits his office and he looks at his top 10 people like, you mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another life ago. I bought yeah. a special pair of shoes just for that job. <laughs> yeah. They were these super duper Jordans. Cause I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, I didn't want to go in there. I don't do the suit and tie thing. It's not my thing. So when I go to meetings and people are like, why are you wearing a suit and tie? That's not my objective. I'm not trying to get people to be better business men. I'm trying to get people to retire. Leave your company behind, be in a good enough spot where you left it in good enough hands where you can sit back and dress like me in a tiki bar on the beach for the rest of your life. That's why I try to get people. So I'm not going to wear a suit and tie and all that other stuff. I mean, I will wear it. I have worn it. But for certain things, nah. Look, we all, you know, we all wear uniforms in life, you know, in, in Wall Street, everybody's accustomed to wearing, you know, a jacket, a jo you know, jacket tie and, uh, and collar shirt, you know, if you're, uh, you know, at one time I used to ride a Harley, you know, you drive Harley, you, you wear, you know, black boots, black pair of pants and, you know, black t-shirt, that's your uniform. You know, if you're, if you're in the army, you, you wear a camouflage. I mean, you know, whatever you belong to, there's a uniform to accept the dress code and that's what you wear. Um, so you just, you know, you wear, you know, whatever you feel is comfortable for you. That's what that's what you wear. And that's this your uniform. uniform. This is my uniform for the rest of life. I put on a monkey suit and chase bad guys down bark, bad, dark alleyways for long enough. This is my uniform from now on. Amen. And it pays off, too. I mean, how many times have you had? You didn't even start. the. Well, you started it by wearing the shirt, but they started the conversation. They came up and, and said something. How often does that happen? Oh my goodness. People offering me gigs. I want you to come speak for my family. How many people are going to be there? 13. Let's do it. For a long time. I used to fly when I lived in Jersey, I would fly to Florida eight, nine times a year just to do that. Speak with families. Mm -hmm. And it came from just walking around with this shirt on and wow. people saying, Oh my gosh, where'd you learn that? My parents taught me that open up the dialogue immediately. I like it. That's cool. That's, that's the best kind of marketing too. Is basically, this is my message. You ready for it? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get it either way. You're All the ego it. gone from that one. <laughs> yeah. You're going to see it later on in night. You're going to be in an argument with your spouse. or you're going to be thinking about something negative and you're going to be like, maybe I shouldn't be in that headspace. <laughs> Boom, that's all I wanted. That is all I wanted. If we never talk again, that is all I wanted. Cause this ain't never going to leave you. This is never going to leave you. But Tom at the very beginning, uh, in his first, uh, comment where he was talking about how he got into doing this, he used the word mindset and I almost felt like going, Okay. Yep. I knew it was going to come up at some point in the conversation. <laughs> we brought it in the first three minutes. Uh, but, but let's talk about mindset a little bit more because, uh, you mentioned earlier, Tom, uh, in, in relation to Neil's question, you know, 40 years ago, I would have thrown you out of, out of my office, but now, you know, 20 people say I need this. So I'm going to pay attention. That's mindset. And I guess my question is, 
at what, first of all, at what point did you realize how important mindset is? And even more importantly, how do you convey that message to the people you're working with? Well, how you convey it is uh, your actions are, um, actions speak louder than words is, you know, one, one way you say it. Um, you know, I said it to this one guy one time, you know, he said something like three times over. And each time I said, well, well I can't hear you. Well, and he just said it louder. And then, uh, well, well, I can't hear you. He said it louder again. And I finally said, look, your actions are so loud. I can't hear your words. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, right. you, your mindset is, is, is yeah. kind of how, how you behave, what you're doing. Um, you know, how, how you get there uh, at the expense of repeating myself, you know, you change your mindset when something, you know, happens to you in life that makes you change your mindset. Hmm. Right. Um, as long as, as long as you're successful and, you know, in the first probably 15 years of my career, Every three years I was getting promoted. You know, I had a wife and, you know, I was on to my second daughter. So life was peachy and cream. So mm -hmm. I thought my mind, you know, I said, well, mindset is great. I mean, life is working for me. Why should I change my mindset? Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, something happened to me and I said, okay, well, I, I better change my mindset. Right. Or, um, you know, it took me a long time. It, many, many years later, I was still very, very immersed in my career. You know, I was traveling five days a week. Uh, really only spending weekends at home. Uh, so family was not getting a lot of my time. Work was getting a lot of my time. So I had these buckets in, in life, you know, one for family, one for, for work. And a lot of the water was in the, in the work bucket. And then, you know, my daughter who's 35 now, she was probably about maybe 14 or 15 at the time. And I forgot what the discussion was about. She just turned to me. She goes, dad, I haven't seen you half my life. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> it was like time for a paradigm change. Talk about a mm. mindset. You know, I was like, all right, well, I, I better reallocate some water into bucket number two uh, b because, you know, it's just that's when a light goes on. Some, you know, just one little statement and and you go, oh, well, that's not good. You know, that's that's not how I want to be remembered. You know, when when my legacy is over, when I, you know, finally six foot under. I don't want my kids to show up at my funeral and say, I don't know who the heck my dad is because I haven't seen him. He was never around. He was always working. He didn't spend any time with me. Right. So, you know, you, you change your mindset because life changes you and, and life humbles you. Um, but as long as you're successful and life is working for you, you probably don't change your mindset because you think everything's good. Yeah, exactly. The way I, I phrase that is perspective changes our mindset. When we have just one perspective, we don't change the mindset. But when we gain new perspectives, like the daughter is saying, uh, I don't see you half the time. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> my perspective just changed a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's funny the impact one sentence from your child can have. Mm. You have 50 grown men saying something in your face and you don't listen, but your child says one sentence and life changing. I'm happy you made that switch, Tom. I'm, I'm a real big family person. I've always had custody of my kids. They've always lived with me and we've been close and we're still close. Uh, family first, baby. Family first. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Really good. I'm loving that. Um, now let's see. We're, we're starting to run a little short on time. We haven't really talked about the book other than the fact that you told us before we got started. Well, everything's going to come out of the book because that's where everything, <laughs> uh, is located. But give it, give us a, a little lay of the land there in terms of what people can find when they, when they actually do pick up the book and start reading it. Just, uh, I, I believe that if you're going to be successful in life, these are the four keys. Um, I call them to, you know, leadership success, but it's really successful life. And, and like I mentioned to you, the, the, the first thing, there's four keys. Um, and the four keys really help you influence, um, your life and other people's life. And, and there's an old saying, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So it helps you lead. It helps you influence. Uh, it helps you get you want to, you know, how do you get to get, how you get to where you want to go. So the first one is, uh, first key is, is basically culture for an organization or character for an individual, right? Um, you want people, uh, you want to be able to influence people. You want to be able to lead people, uh, whether that's your family or work, whatever. You have had a very good sense of who you are. Right. If, if you don't know who you are, then other people are not going to know who you are. So why should they buy into you? And that was a big lesson for me when, you know, I worked for large corporations. It was easy because there was a brand behind you. So it wasn't really about me. It was really about the organization that I worked for. Mm -hmm. uh, then I left corporate America and 
opened my own business. And I, you know, I was always used to surrounding myself with Harvard MBAs and, you know, very educated people and leaders. And, and all of a sudden it was like, Tom, so who the hell are you and why should I work for you? <laughs> right? mm-hmm. Because it was now all of a sudden really all about you, all about me and about my character. Um, so every individual should have a very strong sense of, of who they are and, and what their values are and what the character is. And that's really the equivalent for an organization as they, what their culture is, what their shared values is and what their culture is. And then the second key I already mentioned to you, um, every company and every person should have strong vision for themselves. And that's, again, a long-term future. Dave Ramsey said it best. Dave said, you have a cathedral vision for your future. And a cathedral vision basically said, look, mm-hmm. the European cathedrals, the guy that designed it was never there by the time it got built. You know, it took 75, 100 years to build those cathedrals. So mm-hmm. do you have something that's going to outlive you? Um, so with that vision. And then the third one is uh, have a growth plan for you. So I, I love uh, Neil's uh, daily exercise between, you know, 12 and 2 of, of really improving himself and building himself because that's part of your growth plan. You know, how do you improve every day? Uh, what direction you go to? But again, make sure that that growth plan aligns with your vision. So that's, I think, extremely important um, that you don't get distracted by the latest shiny object. You know, whatever that long-term vision is, make sure you're growing in that direction and not in the different direction because you can also grow in, a, in the wrong direction. So that's, uh, that's I think, important. And, and the fourth one um, I think is equally important is um, – Who's in your inner circle? Right? We talked about mm-hmm. people cheerleading you on, and uh, the inner circle, I think, is extremely important. And, and one of the uh, mistakes that people make, uh, especially in business, is you know they call it, oh, the chemistry, right? And, and all that means is they kind of like to surround themselves with like-minded individuals, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's the biggest mistake you can make because if you all think alike, you're all going to have the same blind spots, and you're yeah. all going to go – off in the, the wrong direction. So, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about diversity in this world, uh, but we talk about diversity of skin color, of gender, or sexual orientation, all that stuff. Um, I love to talk about diversity of thought, diversity of mindset. And, um, you know, if, if you know, in, in the interest of diversity, you know, you get 20 people in the same room with the same skin color, and all of a sudden now you think you're diverse, right? Um, but you all think alike. You haven't done anything right. And so, <laughs> so, so think differently. Surround yourself with people that think that. And, and look, that's a lot tougher than you think because human nature is to say the person that doesn't think like me is not right, is not correct. They're 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 viewing the world wrong. They're problem solving wrong. Um, and I used to think that early on. If you asked me 40 years ago, I was like. Man, these people are a bunch of procrastinators. They can't do anything. All they do is sit around and procrastinate. And then, you know, when the light went on later on in my life, I was like, oh, well, they're not procrastinators. They're just very highly analytical people, right? They analyze, you know, they analyze the crap out of things, right? But that's actually good because if they didn't make that analysis, that extra two, three or four steps, we kind of go off in the wrong direction maybe and, and, and go full speed ahead. But we're not going the right way because we didn't have people analyzing it, right? So, just really getting people on your team that think diversely, uh, think differently than you are and appreciate what they bring to the table because, you know, now you got the same problem in the room, but you have six different solutions instead of one solution. And maybe the other two or three solutions are much better than the one you thought about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are the, uh, those are the four keys. They're beautiful. I, I especially love that, that perspective bit that we were talking about that before. I, I don't think there's anything more valuable in the perspective. And I've gained that from just doing the show, from having so many different perspectives of people mm-hmm. coming onto the show. I don't always agree with them all, you know, that, but it's with one exception I can think of. And that's just because he was just plain rude. <laughs> uh, he was. I mean, he, he, well, he, 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 well, you never heard it because I never published it, but uh, he, he, came, <laughs> he came on the show and he started uh, harping on the co-host who couldn't make it that day, but he was like attacking her like crazy. And she wasn't even there to defend herself. And I said, no, 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 no. You don't get that yeah. around here. Sorry. Yeah. That's, that's, that doesn't work around here. But really? other than that one. <laughs> You're on the cutting room floor, buddy. Yeah, right. <laughs> but other than that one, there have been a number of times where people brought in perspectives that were pretty challenging to me, but I learned from them. And I think that's really what you're talking about when you say that, you know, people have this tendency to find like-minded people. What they're really doing is they're feeling comfortable because they feel the same thought pattern going on. Yep. They don't realize they need the discomfort of those different perspectives. That discomfort is where the growth comes from. And it's not just the personal growth, it's the company growth. It's all of it. 
It's growing and, in every and look, way. you know, and it's a shame. I mean, I don't know how the hell we got to where we are today as a country, but people can't talk to each other anymore. You know, it's it's like uh, we can spend a whole another show on on cancel culture and all that stuff, but you know, it, 30, 40 years ago, I may not have agreed to with somebody, but I can have a dis- discussion with them. You know, I may not be able to convince them. I can try to convince them. They try to convince me. We have a dialogue. Uh, I see something from their perspective that I didn't see before. But now nobody's having conversations. You know, people no, we just, are. Like, yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, like everybody's an idiot. Everybody gets canceled. Nobody, you know, it's like, where the hell, do, how the hell do we get like this in a country? Nobody can talk to each other. This is nuts. Unfortunately, I always remember that uh, the people who are in that mindset are themselves crashing. So they're, they're, yeah. they're going to find out one way or another. It's just a question of how they're going to find out. <laughs> it could be the painful way. It could be the easier way. It's up to them. But uh, uh, also, Neil, before we uh, wrap up here, we got to get uh, a little info from you because we got your summit coming up. This now, this is uh, th- this is basically last weekend's postponed because you weren't able to do it last weekend. So tell people, you know, what's going on tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I have a summit. You guys know Neil Positivity Thoughts Become Things Summit. I was supposed to happen last week, but I woke up vomiting. <laughs> my stomach hit me with that bug. And I, despite my hardest efforts, I actually sat in the chair. I was ready to go, but I kept getting lightheaded and I kept vomiting. So I postponed it and it's happening now this Saturday uh, from noon to 4 p.m. Eastern time. It's like you guys said, that diversity. We're getting the law of attraction. Just like there's three of us here, there's going to be six of us there. Bouncing ideas off each other, mental exercises, different cultures coming together, different rhyme, race, religions, and, uh, you know, just birthing new ideas. It's going to be a great time. We'll always leave the summit feeling amazing with a whole sheet full of notes. This board is going to be full of notes and different mental exercises to manifest things like retirement and that next car or a better health or a better relationship uh, with your spouse or your loved one, your kids or whatever, all that. All that. So, like I said, register at neilsloasummit.com. I'll throw the link in the chat box. And uh, I'll see you guys then. I'd love to have Tom. I'd love to have you pop up on the screen. Walt's going to come in and bless us with his presence. Debbie is, too. It's going to be all time, all around great time and great atmosphere. Yeah, I'll post it. It's going to be a good thing. I'm definitely yeah. going to be dro- doing a drop by. And, uh, Tom, you t- we told, we talked about the book. You told us about the, the four basic uh, pillars of the book. But what if somebody wants to reach out and find you? How do they find you? Uh, pretty easy. I have a, I've been cursed and blessed with a last name. Uh, <laughs> you know, I know as, as, as you guys experienced it, it was, ah, how do you say that? Right. So, <laughs> but the, the fact is if, if you Google Caresti or you go to LinkedIn to Caresti, I pop up on my sister and my three daughters. That's it. Uh, so it's K E R E S Z T I. There's not a lot of us in this world. So, um, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on my, uh, webpage and, um, uh, yeah, just, uh, Give me a call. Drop me an email. Happy to talk to you. And one final thought I want to share with you, uh, which I make it a practice to share because you, like so many people who come onto this program, are givers. And you're a giver. And I like to recognize that giving because there are certain ways we, we kind of skip past it. And I think it's important to recognize. There are many people who you'll never meet, you'll never see, who have heard you on a podcast. They read the book. They you know, saw an article that you wrote, they, they were in some way touched by you, but you never saw what happened with them. And yet the ripples that come out of that just go on and on and on and on. And and so I think we deserve to be recognized for that. So on behalf of all those people you've never met, you've never seen, whose lives you have touched, thank you for what you have been doing and thank you for what you continue to do. Well, thanks for having me guys. It was a pleasure and a fun, fun time. It was mutual, I can assure you. Neo, looking forward to tomorrow. I'll be dropping by, seeing you there. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.